here. Uh, I'd like to read a poem just to give you a taste of the book, uh, Hair Raising. This poem is written by Willie Coleman, and it kind of sums up this presentation. You can learn a whole lot of stuff sitting in them beauty shop chairs. Used to be, you could meet a whole lot of other women sitting there along with hair crying, spit flying, and babies crying. Used to be, you could learn a whole lot about how to catch up with yourself and some other folks in your household. <coughs> Lots more got taken care of than hair, because in our mutual obvious dislike for nappiness, we came together under the hot comb to share and share and share. But now we walk heads high, naps full of pride, with not a backward glance at some of the beauty which used to be, because with the natural, there is no natural place for us to congregate to mull over our mutual discontent. Beauty shops could have been a hell of a place to ferment a revolution. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to hair, hair is for black women much more than just an aesthetic, much more than just um, an accoutrement or an appearance or a style. And so I'm gonna go through a short synopsis before our beautiful models walk, and then I will actually walk them down the aisle um, according to where they fit on this timeline of black hair. So hair history and privilege. Um, during chattel slavery, during the transatlantic slave trade, hairstyles were banned. So anyone who has an African American lineage has a history of banned black hairstyles. Um, we're gonna go before the oppression, but first we kind of need to look at um, what happened to our hairstyles here in America. <clears throat> so during chattel slavery, there was um, a process of biological subjugation that included an elevation of white beauty that included um, colorism as well as um, what would be considered kind of hairism or texturism. And so we had the brown paper bag test where if your skin was as light as a brown paper bag during the reconstruction era, you would be able to pass for entry into certain jobs, certain schools, where during actually chattel slavery, if um, you had lighter skin, sometimes you would have a, a better position and less, um, less oppression in the plantation slave system. So the brown paper bag test also has to do with um, hair. And we talk a lot about colorism, but we don't talk about hair types and the hierarchy, which we know that white supremacy is a hierarchy on the basis of skin color, right? But it also takes into account other racial characteristics like hair texture. And so type one to type eight, hair is actually typed, and the type one is straight to minimal wave. And type one was, the hierarchy was at the pinnacle of good hair. And that was based on white supremacy, based on racism. Type two was open wave, type three was wavy, type four was curly, um, like this. It's type, type four to type five here. Um, Type six is very coiled. This is where the hair start, can start to naturally dread with palm rolling. Um, I do that because I... <laughs> um, so very coiled and type uh, seven and type eight then was, were um, also on this chart of what we would call nappiness. And so that palm refers to nappy in the sense of very textured, heavily textured zigzag, zigzag and coiled hair. Um, we're going to go through a timeline of 25,000 years ago, um, if the first artifact documenting patterned African hairstyles was seen in the Venus of Villendorf, which was mirrored by um, cave paintings that showed talk waves, and then 6,000 years ago, the first hair combs were discovered in Kemet, which were made from Ivory. These are actually very sophisticated, very beautiful hair combs. We're going to have our first two models walk, and these first two models have um, their hair in a mixture of plaits and